conceptual perspective. Talk about special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time you know outside of the businesses that i run like myriad business solutions the visionetics institute odyssey media group i also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in houston dallas and other areas uh, i'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Um, I'm going to do everything I can to be as brief as possible, but I, I have to talk about this. Um, you heard the preemptive video. If you believe in what we're doing, show some love and support because we definitely need uh, to increase our efforts. Um, I'm going to start with um, the whole Brittany Griner thing. Being a Houstonian and actually being from the north side of Houston and being aware of Brittany when she was at Nim Nimitz High School before she became Brittany, Brittany, Brittany Griner. She's always been known because we're talking about she was 6'8 in high school, uh, dunking and doing all the things she was doing. So she got a lot of notoriety um but so knowing her outside of who she is representing the lgbt community and all this other stuff that's going on now she's uh britney uh from nimitz high school and so there's a part of me that's definitely happy that that's over uh let me first be very clear in saying this britney griner was a political prisoner um Am I saying that she should have been she shouldn't have been more aware of the possibilities and the the, the, the political climate between um, the US and the uh, the Russian government and a bunch of other things and she shouldn't have had that uh, vape uh, pen with her. I'm not saying she shouldn't have. I'm saying you 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 have a responsibility to yourself, but I'm saying, that people do things that they shouldn't do and uh, we have a right and a voice to sit up and say if we don't believe what what the consequences were were in correspondence with the infraction we have a right to say that but when it's someone else's government you have very little influence if any at all to do anything about it and that's where most of Americans found themselves pulling for her but saying we don't have anything and demanding that the government do something. Now that the government did something and they made a swap, now there's a measurement going on on whether it would, you know, been a, whether it should have been Brittany or whether it should have been a Marine uh, or something like that. That's the argument going on. Everybody is pissed off because she actually got released based on off a of prisoner swapping. I'm not here to talk about the yays and nays of that. I'm here to say it was a political uh, uh, act in the beginning. She was a political prisoner. Uh, in my opinion, all political prisoners should be freed. I don't think that I want to be a part of trying to determine whose freedom is more important than the others. Um, everybody has some things about them that other people may or may not like. I, I don't want to be judging somebody's need to be free based on differences in lifestyle, differences in opinion, and things of that nature. Um, I do believe that if this Marine was taken as a result of being a Marine, I think definitely there should be some efforts 
put forth to bring him home to his family. That's what I think about when I think about um, people being released, uh, when being held. To me, it's not being in prison. You're not in prison. You're being held captive. You've been kidnapped and you're being used as leverage. You being used to make political statements. You being used to push and force action. And Russia got what they wanted out of it. They got the U.S. to fold and give them something. Uh, something the U.S. says they doesn't do. Well, they got that. So that was their pull. That you know they played. They played a card and they got it. Uh, so here's my problem. Again, like I said, I, I'm I, I, I'm not the one to determine whose family gets to see their loved one come home. I'm not here to judge who's more important in the grand scheme of things. I think that, again, we've gotten caught up in, in, in the wrong thing. I think that, hey, we should be happy that she's home. This is my opinion. We should be happy that she's home, if she's home yet. You know, she may not even be home yet, but she's, from what I understand, she's been released and she's in the custody of the U.S. Um, so, if she's made it home by now, which I doubt, but if she's made it home, great, she's home. If not, she's free, uh, and that's important. Uh, my stand is all political free prisoners need to be freed. Um, if they're solely being held for the sake of leverage against other governments, they need to be freed. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, the order in which it happens is enough for me to decide. That's uh, something I don't want to give a whole lot of energy to because, again, I don't control it. Here's something I do have an ability Im to impact. And here's where I think our rage should actually be aimed at. We love to uh, express our rage. We get mad about all the different types of things that go on that we don't have any control on or, or that don't have a direct impact on us. And we lose sight of the things that do. Um, I was sharing with my partner, uh, business partner, uh, Tiffany Banks, and there is a case that happened last month. I don't know how it got past me because none of this stuff lands on my desk, but um, Tiffany brought it to my attention. Uh, she shared it. Um, a black man, 23 years old, I want to say, uh, I'm not looking at the actual case now, but 23 years old shot and killed his ex-girlfriend or soon-to-be ex-girlfriend her mom her sister and her niece janice serrano for asia baker 29 shante naismith 28 and gail baker 49 were all killed at the house there was a argument he began began to take his clothes and belongings out of the house came back in the house and shot them all the only ones that survived was one one of the other sisters was shot and ran out to get in and in, in, in went and got help. And her other two kids, that was her four-year-old daughter that kid died, and her other two kids were hiding under blankets. He then shot himself, but he survived. He was taken to the hospital. Something that, when Tiffany shared this, that happened that really, really bothers me, a black man in an organization that we operate with, close to a hundred thousand people in it in the group um said that that's none of his business that's a pol police matter and tiffany responded i feel sorry for the women around you and he got mad and basically she said he told her to kiss his ass uh but it's that mindset and it's not just males but i'm gonna start with my brothers first our number one yearning as men, but definitely as black men, is to be respected. There's no greater drive in a man than to be respected. Men have, men have killed because they felt disrespected. Matter of fact, if you were to survey the prison population for violent crimes, you'll find that the vast majority of violent crimes um, outside of things that have to do with poverty, but most of them are going to be somewhere along the line of feeling disrespected. And um, this is a scientific fact. I've done the research. But let me tell you something, men, that 
until we can prove ourselves to be consistent in our ability to protect our women, to provide safe haven for our women. This, this safe haven that I'm speaking of is not uh, contingent upon them behaving a certain way and meeting our approval. It has to be an inherent and instinctive behavior within ourselves that when a black woman sees a black man that she does not know, she automatically feels safer in an environment. If she's in an environment where she feels a little un unsure or unsafe and she sees a black man, she should be put at ease that she's not alone and that if something goes on, she's safe. If she is in peril, she should be able to see a black man and say, if I run to him, he's got my back. What she shouldn't have is a situation where the vast majority of people, black females between the ages of 15 and 44 are meeting their demise at the hand of a black man and that she feels unsafe and unsure by approaching a black man and then if it is if it, it, it and for the black men who aren't the ones who are the, the the culprits they're taking a disinterest in doing anything to stop it it's not my problem it's a police matter no see it, it's the man's problem too defend and protect the home. It's the black man's uh, responsibility to defend and protect the community. It is a black man's responsibility to make sure those who are weaker than he is are protected by him. That should be an inherent and instinctive behavior. We missed the bus on that one altogether. Everybody is so conditioned into caring and thinking about ourselves that we have completely lost our responsibility as a unit as a community as a cohesive and unified group they told us 60 years ago that their greatest fear was us unifying and yet we consistently allow ourselves to be splintered and live in schismatic uh, unclaves and in, 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 in groups and behaviors and everybody's upset with everybody. Everybody's thinking about ourselves. One of the greatest feats that has been accomplished through colonialism and slavery is the individualized mindset. The idea that I don't have to be concerned with anyone else but me. As long as I'm okay, I'm good. And what happens is eventually the devil comes knocking at your door. Now, all of a sudden, you want everybody to mobilize and stand with you and pray with you and walk with you and fight with you because now somebody you care about has met the same demise that so many others that you shunned or you turned your nose up at. We've got to do better. Uh, it's not just the black man. Uh, when I look around and I see what's going on, We've got to do a better job, sisters, of trusting our intuition in choices. We've got to do a better job of healing so that whatever it is that makes us feel that we're needing to be with someone who doesn't know how to treat us. That part, we, we, uh, in a podcast today, I talked about that. We talked about that today in a podcast. We are going to have to deal with the healing. I, but here is this violence thing that I keep talking about. I've been talking about it for 20 years now. I've been telling you about the need to properly socialize and engage young black males at an early age for the purpose of racially socializing them so that they have a sense of identity, a sense of purpose, a sense of belonging, a sense of responsibility as black males so that as they develop into men, they understand the new and unique dynamic of black manhood. It is the most unique manhood dynamic on the planet. No other man has the same experiences and same challenges and uh, unique hostilities aimed at them as the black man. And yet we are still expected to respond and be what we should be for our people. This is not the time to sit up and talk about who's at fault for anything. There's enough culpability to go around. What we have to understand is every day. Uh, let me tell you something. I talked about this today as well. I was born to a 15-year-old 
mother and an absent father who was 21. I never met my father. He never thought enough of me to make his presence felt at any point in my life until he passed away when I was 14. The first time I ever got to see my father was at his funeral. So the the father I had, the, the role model I had was my great grandfather. My grandmother's father was the closest thing I had to a father. That age difference made it real difficult to relate in a normal way of relating and aspiring because he was so much older than me. There was so much he had to move so far away from that he didn't relate to me and so much that I couldn't see in my close, in my near future with him because he was far beyond those ages. But he loved me enough that he modeled it for me. He modeled the carefulness and the gentleness of how uh, he handled my great grandmother. He modeled the carefulness and gentleness in which he taught me manhood by example, by uh, by word, but more by example, by how he moved, how he operate, how he had very strong presence in physical appearance, in in spiritual appearance, in emotional appearance. But he didn't lord it over anybody. But when it was necessary to stand up and be strong, he did it boldly. He did it, did it unapologetically. And he was consistent in that. You were safe in his presence. You never thought for a moment anything was going to happen to you if Pops was around. And he taught me to be that same person. Now, I could have easily sit up and said, well, you know, my mom had me when she was 15. That messed me up because she was never a mom to me. I was reared by my great grandparents. I could sit up and say, man, my Pops was never there. He never showed up, never cared. He never loved me. Or I could sit up and say, uh, it stops with me. I'm going to find a way to be the man I'm supposed to be. And see, I didn't, I didn't only do that. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I'm the perfect father. I'm not saying I've been the perfect husband. And I'm not saying I'm the perfect man. Now, what I am saying is that every day I wake up and I want to be the best. I want to be what I'm supposed to be. I want my community. I want my, my family. I want the people who are in my periphery to believe that I got their back, that I'm going to stand with them, that I'm going to walk with them. And it's not always easy. Sometimes you're going to put yourself in peril to be a man. That's a part of manhood. Martin Luther King said, if a man doesn't have something for which he is willing to die, he's not fit to live. The problem is we want to go out and do everything and we'll die behind stupid stuff, but we won't stand up for the thing that has value, the things that bring strength, the the things that bring love, the things that bring power. We won't stand for that, but we'll go out and die over a block that we don't own. We'll go over and die over some sneakers. We'll, we'll go over and we'll pass that same mentality down to the younger bucks. And then some of us ain't dying for nothing. We're going to have to catch you to kill you because you ain't fighting for nothing. You ain't standing for nothing. And, and that's a problem. Everybody's mad because Britney got released and the Marine didn't. Oh, there are a whole lot more political prisoners than those two. But that's what everybody's mad about. But nobody's mad about the rate at which young black women are dying. Or young black boys are killing each other. Nobody's upset that she was one of the premier faces of the LGBTQ community. And they were quiet as a mouse while she went through what she went through. All these little things we hang our hats on that don't do anything for us. And when we have a time to stand together, we're off doing something else. We need to stop the killing of black women. We cannot have a situation where the second leading cause of death for, for black females between 15 and 44 is intimate partner homicide with the vast majority of those partners being black men. We cannot consistently justify that we cannot consistently sit up and say that it's okay by silent condemnation meaning that we're not doing anything about it we're not speaking on it we're not standing on it silent condemnation is the equivalent of saying it's okay you don't get to have silent condemnation. We don't get to have silent condemnation with our young girls and boys who are being molested in the homes and we're pretending like it doesn't happen. We don't get to have that. We've got to stop with the silent condemnation. We've got to stop with the, if it ain't me, I ain't bothered with it. We've got to stop and we've got to wake up and we've got to sit up and say that it's not going to happen on my watch.
we've got to wake up and say, you know what? Enough is enough. I don't have any energy to be trying to determine which political prisoner. I've been hoping that the young girl would be released. I didn't think that nine years in a maximum security facility, uh, nine years of hard labor was the equivalent, but I don't make the laws in Russia. And I am going to say that, yes, it was her responsibility to understand that she had played for them multiple years. This wasn't new to her. So either she had been bringing it and it wasn't a problem because she is an athlete and, you know, contributing to the economy by way of being an athlete. Or she got too comfortable. And they, my thing is, the reason I think that it was the former is because right at the time when there's this peak in hostility between the U.S. and Russia, she gets popped, tells me they knew it was there. What is the chance of the one time that she forgets and accidentally packs it, they stop her? Tells me they've always known. And this was just one of those times where they didn't let her make it. And you have to kind of, again, have your pulse on the situation and on the environment. Uh, I'm glad, nevertheless, that she's been released. Uh, whoever this Marine is, I hope that he gets released too. White, black, Latino, it doesn't matter to me. Any, and, and, and while I have issues with my country, I have a respect for people who are willing to commit themselves to contracts where they give up their freedom and their to move about in order to be a part of a military that defends this country. Um, how they are used sometimes I definitely don't agree with, but I have a respect for people who put them li their lives in that situation. Um, and so I, I hope he comes home. Uh, but we have our own war raging in our community. Too many of our children are dying. Too many of our women are dying. Too many of our young black men are dying. And not just at, not just from homicide, not just from femicide or fratricide, but also from suicide. There's so much that we need to be unpacking. And yet here we are. There's so much that we should be unpacking. There's so much we should be investing in. There's so much that we should be doing and we're not doing it. On that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get off. Uh, there's work to be done. We've been on this journey and battlefield. Uh, I've been doing it for 30 years. The Odyssey Project's been doing it for 20. And we're still pushing. Um, look. It's time to make a change. We need to, uh, you've heard me quote this before. Uh, Frederick Douglass says, it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. These broken men are wreaking havoc in our community. And it's because we failed them. I'm not making excuses for them. When you do something like that, you have to pay the cost. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not making excuses, but I'm telling you that if we don't do something about it, it continues. We have to have an understanding of the cause so that we can stop the effect. But it's not going to happen because we say, oh, my God, it's not going to stop because we say, wow, it's not going to stop because that's that's ridiculous. That's horrible. None of those things posted on a post in the comment field. It's going to change it. It's going to require direct engagement. It's going to require a universal effort to properly socialize and develop young black males who happen to be trying to figure this thing out with 1.5 million black males missing that are not in the community to model manhood with another significant portion of the population erroneously modeling manhood. 
All of these things are working against them. It's our responsibility to right that ship. Nobody else's responsibility. I don't care who did what. I don't care how it was socially engineered. At the end of the day, we're responsible for us. On that note, I am going to get off. I am going to uh, move into the next phase of my day. But I'm going to challenge you to be a part of the solution. Support the work we do, get involved, be a part of a program. We need a universal rite of passage. We need a universal definition of black manhood. We need to understand what we're striving for, and none of that is happening right now. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have a great day.